So this isn't something that's used too often in the world of digital logic. Um, it's more of a software concept, and that's the idea of stacks and queues. Uh, but I would like to go over the idea here, just because even though we don't necessarily use it in circuit form all too often, it is still a useful concept to understand. So what exactly are stacks and queues? Stacks and queues are basically different ways of handling incoming streams of data. For example, say you have a, a stream of data coming in like this, and you have some kind of a circuit that can handle that data. If the data is coming in faster than the circuit can handle, then you need to buffer it in some kind of memory. We'll just say RAM for now. Now, you can just throw it in, in RAM, that's fine. The thing is, if you just throw it any which way, you'll quickly lose track of what data goes where. And so stacks and queues are basically just ways of managing memory in such a way that you can access that data in a particular order. And so with a queue, a queue is fairly simple. It's, it, it is, as the name suggests, it's just a queue. So as data comes in, it queues up. We get you know data one, data two, data three, data four, and so on and so forth. It basically grows like this. The circuit will then come along when it's ready and grab that data off the queue, first in, first out. So since this was the first in, it's gonna grab that one first, then that one, then that one, then that one. Stacks, on the other hand, are the exact opposite of that. They are what's referred to as first in, last out. So we have data coming in, it will queue up here, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. When the circuit finally comes along and grabs the data, it grabs from the top starting with that one, then that one, then that one, and then that one. It goes in the opposite direction. Now, a queue should make sense. If a piece of data comes in that needs to be processed, it makes sense that if it's the first in, it's the, it should be the first out. But a stack, why would you have a data structure like that? So in order to understand it more thoroughly, let's take a look at something other than data. Let's instead take a look at tasks. So say you have something over here that's generating tasks for you. Maybe it's a boss, maybe it's life, who knows. But you have tasks that are coming in, and you as a person, you can only handle one task at a time. Well, in order to make sure that all those tasks are taken care of, you would use a queue. So as a task comes in, it queues up. The next task comes in, it queues up again. Next task comes in, it queues up. And you, when you want to grab that task, you just grab the first one. And then when you're done with that, you grab the next one, and then the next one, until all of the tasks are done, or you reach the end of the day, in which case the queue basically stops until you can pick it up again. But say you are working on a single task, and you find out that in order to complete this task, it actually requires another task to be completed first. Maybe there's something that this other task produces that this task requires. Well, what you would do is you would take this task and you would put it on a stack. And then this task would then be moved into your immediate uh, field of, of concern. You would be concerning yourself with this task. Let's say, for example, you need to wash the dishes. That's the task that you're dealing with. But uh-oh, you're currently out of dishwashing detergent. So you take the task of washing the dishes, you put it on the stack. You then take the task of getting dishwash detergent, and you bring that into your immediate focus. You then go out to the car to run to the store, and you find out that your tank is on E. So you take that uh, getting dishwashing detergent task, you put that on the stack. And now you have to focus on getting gas for your car. Once you've gotten the gas for your car, you can complete that task and resume getting the task of getting dishwashing detergent. And once that's done, you can then take your dishwashing detergent and resume the task of starting the dishes. I know this is a little bit messy, and this is probably some very, very convoluted visuals, but just understand this: the, the concept here is that when you've got a bunch of tasks just coming in, the best way to handle them is with a queue. And when you've got tasks that require other tasks that need to be completed first, you can use a stack to temporarily hold on to the uncompleted tasks until the required tasks are done. Okay, so how about circuit form? What does this look like as a circuit? Well, as I said, usually stacks and queues are just ways of managing memory, so what you will need is memory. In this case, we're just going to use plain old ordinary RAM. In order to simulate the function of a queue, then what we need to do is we need to start stacking um, pieces of information into RAM such that uh, it never overwrites memory that's already in there. And then when we want to pull from memory, we want to pull from the bottom of that stack. So. If, uh, if memory comes in, it's going to go here. We'll just say A. Um, if another one comes in, it's going to go here. 
next one goes here, then here. And then when we read, we want to get A. So if we, if we read, we're going to get A. Then if we read again, we're going to get B. And so the easiest way to go about this is basically you could have two pointers. The first one is going to point to the top of the available queue. And the next one is going to point to the next one that's going to be read. So as another piece of information comes in, let's say E comes in, that pointer then gets moved to the next slot. And then as we read information from the queue, um, say we read A, um, we would then move that pointer up as well. And so if we look at the timing for that sort of situation, what we see here is we see that if we want to write to a queue, um, we would first, well, we would first present the data on the data in, and then we would pulse the, the add sig uh, signal. Um, what that would do is during the, the rising edge, it would write the value of data in to memory. And then on the falling edge, it would then increment the top pointer to the next value. Likewise, when reading, um, when we activate the remove signal, this is going to be sort of like a, a read signal, so it's going to be held on for a bit longer. Um, we hold the remove signal on, data out, gets the data that's present in memory, and that uses the bottom pointer, which is still zero at this point. Um, when we're done reading, though, on the falling edge of remove, the bottom pointer gets incremented from zero to one. And so to implement this sort of timing information, what we can do um, is we can take a just a, a bit of RAM here, um, and we can produce a different address depending on which pointer we want to use. So again, we have two pointers. We have the top pointer, we have the bottom pointer, and depending on whether we are reading or writing, we want to use one or the other. So from the address signal, we can actually go into a uh, multiplexer, and we can just connect those up to a couple different uh, counter registers, because again, we're just going to be counting up. It doesn't really matter too much. And so what we'll do is we'll just use this one as the top counter register and this one as the bottom counter register. And so when we want to remove, we want to use the bottom counter register, which is why I've got that on the one. So this remove signal is going to primarily control the mux. So when remove goes on, it selects the bottom register. So long as remove stays off, it selects the top register. Now, when we're removing, we're effectively reading. So we also want to tie that to the read of our RAM here. And then on the falling edge of the remove signal, we want to increment the bottom counter register. So we can just connect that like that. And likewise with top, that's basically just going to be connected directly to the right. So um, if we have the add signal coming in here, we can pretty much just connect that directly to right. And that's going to happen on the rising edge. So we're just going to connect it like that. But then on the falling edge, we want to we want to increment the top pointer. So we'll go ahead and connect that as well through falling edge this time. And that is basically our Q circuit. Now, there are a few edge cases that you want to take into consideration if you are going to build this. Like I said, this is just a very basic uh, Q circuit. First thing you want to take into consideration, though, it is it is not asynchronous. If something is writing to the Q, it, something else cannot be simultaneously reading from it. Um, the second thing is, of course, RAM is not an infinite space, it is finite. And so what will likely happen is if you run out of RAM, um, you can basically just overflow each of these pointers and start back from the beginning. That's no problem. The only problem arises when the top pointer suddenly catches up to the bottom pointer. Um, likewise, if you are trying to remove from an empty queue, obviously the bottom pointer and the top pointer are going to be equal. So if that sort of condition is met, you probably want to disable the ability to remove something from the queue because at that point it's empty. Um, those sorts of things are things you want to watch for when you build this sort of circuit, but honestly, it's not difficult to, to create safety mechanisms to prevent that sort of thing from happening. But again, just for the sake of you know sim a simple circuit that we can use as a starting point, this is your basic queue. So what about a stack then? If a queue requires two pointers and, you know, basically you're going to stick things into the memory based on the top pointer and pull things based on the bottom, um, what does a stack look like? Well, fortunately, a stack is actually a lot simpler. Um, in fact, all we need is one pointer because, again, the data that comes into uh, the stack is the first to come out. So we just need to keep track of the top of the stack. Um, but basically what that's going to look like is we're going to have a pointer that points at the, the very bottom of the stack. 
And when we enter in some information, we then move the pointer up. So put in some more information, move the pointer up. Put in some more, move the pointer up. And so the the result of doing it this way is the pointer always points to, to the next available uh, slot in the stack. Um, and then when we read, of course, we can't read the value that's currently at the top because it's pointing to nothing at this point. What we have to do is we have to first decrement our pointer, and then we can read the value from the stack. Looking at the timing charts that we would generate from that sort of behavior, we can see that, uh, well, we'll have two inputs. We'll have the push and pop. Those are basically the names for read and write in a stack. Um, and so when we're writing, we would concern ourselves with the push uh, input because we are pushing data onto the stack. So that's going to basically send a pulse um, with the data input on the data bus. We send the pulse, it writes to memory. And then on the falling edge, um, that top pointer is then going to increment, ensuring that the pointer is always pointing to the next available point in the stack. Likewise, when reading, we're concerning ourselves with the pop uh, input here because we are popping values off the stack. Um, when that goes high, we first want to take the top pointer and decrement it. So right on the writing edge, uh, we decrement that value. And then during the duration of the pop signal, we're basically just reading from memory. So data out is going to be equal to whatever is in memory at address zero. And so if we wanted to build a circuit, again, what we're going to need is we're going to need some RAM. And that address is basically just going to come from a single counter register. We're just going to be using one register, but of course, because it can go um, counting up as well as counting down, we'll need to use an up-down counter register. Now, instead of having a clock and an up-down signal, I'm going to go with this style of up-down counters where um, we have two clockable inputs, one being the up and one being down. And so we want those to clock during certain events. Um, in this case, we want the, the up counter to clock when we uh, have a falling edge on the push. So that's going to be a falling edge sensitive input. Um, and then likewise, down, we're going to happen on the rising edge of pop. So that's going to be a rising edge sensitive input. So we're just going to leave it like that. But then we're going to have the two inputs, pop and push. And those are going to be our controls. Pop is going to decrement the counter. So that's going to connect to that directly. Push is going to increment the counter. So that's going to connect to that directly through our falling edge circuit here. And then again, pop is basically going to read from RAM, and then push is going to write to RAM. And that's basically our stack circuit. It's a lot simpler than the Q circuit because, again, we're only dealing with one counter. Um, and then as far as edge cases are concerned, things that you want to watch out for, there is something referred to as a stack overflow condition. Um, and that's basically where the stack exceeds its bounds. Uh, in this case, if we're just using straight memory, its bounds is the capacity of memory. But sometimes you can see uh, a stack is allocated only a portion of memory. Either way, if the counter's uh, value exceeds the maximum uh, register or the, the maximum addressable space in memory, you have what's referred to as a stack overflow condition. And so in this case, you can basically just check to make sure that the counter um, isn't equal to zero, because if it overflows, it's going to come back to zero. If it gets to that point, we have a stack overflow condition, then we have a problem. Um, the other thing, of course, is you obviously don't want to pop from an empty stack. So if the counter is equal to zero, you want to disable pop. Again, those are sorts of edge cases that you can create circuits to handle. In this case, I'm just showing you the basic circuit right here. But yeah, that's, that's your basic uh, stacking queue circuit. Now, again, this sort of circuit doesn't really have a whole lot of use in, in digital logic circuits. Um, so I'm basically just showing this to you as a, as a nice, easy way to get the idea across. But later on, when we start to discuss uh, computational theory, um, we are going to start seeing stacks and queues uh, used a little bit more frequently, more specifically stacks, um, because there is actually quite a lot of use for the stack in computers. So uh, Again, it's not really used right now. It'll basically be used later on, but for the time being, I figured I'd just cover the topic.